I'd like you to draw on your page, and take at least half a page to do it, please. I'd like you to draw a quadrilateral. Don't do it yet. But you're going to draw a quadrilateral with the following properties. Number one, it needs to be different to the quadrilateral of the person next to you or around you. I want you all to have as different kinds of quadrilaterals as you can. That's the first quality. The second one is try not to make it like a special quadrilateral. Try and make it a bit random, a bit weird looking. Not like a square, like it's a very specialized quadrilateral, yeah? Try and draw something that's a bit irregular, bit strange, different to the person next to you. I'll give you about 30 seconds. Off you go. Just to remind you, quadrilateral, polygon, four sides. Yep, you've got it. Okay, fantastic. I've got a couple here because um, I'm a chronic overachiever. All right, now here's what you need to do with your quadrilateral, and this is especially why the ruler is not just to make it like straight and all that kind of thing. You also need to do some measurements for me. Here's what you're going to do. With your ruler, I'd like you to find <clears throat> the midpoint of each of the four sides that you've drawn. You get, you've got four sides, therefore four midpoints. Go ahead and measure them out and mark the midpoints, please. Eyes up for a second. Even if you're not quite finished getting your midpoints, you can finish doing that shortly. <clears throat> Maybe your page looks something like this at the moment, uh, I'm hoping. If you do have another color, the secondary color will be useful for this part. I wonder if as you look at the four midpoints you've got, you notice anything unusual about them. Uh, because, remember, I asked you to draw what I like to call, not the technical term, an unspecial quadrilateral, like some weird, random, irregular thing, right? You may have even, if you're a smarty pants, come up with what we call a non-convex polygon, because you can see this thing's jutting in, it's got an obtuse, uh, a reflex angle in there, right? Now, nonetheless, and stare hard, right? You may notice there is, even though an unspecial quadrilateral, what you started with, you've created a very special shape with your four midpoints. And you'll be able to see it, you can go ahead and do this now, if you join in a new polygon each of those midpoints into a new quadrilateral. Have you got it there? Join them up. And I promise, no matter how weird a quadrilateral you began with, you've created what kind of shape? That's a parallelogram, thank you. Pavani, parallelogram, parallelogram, parallelogram. Now, if you're like, I oh, don't believe it, right? Look at the person who's next to you. This is why I asked you to draw one that's different to the persons beside you. Sure enough, you all have created a parallelogram, no matter what shape you began with. Now, here's what you're going to do for the next few minutes, and I invite you to try and work this out with the people around you. I hope you've been mathematicians long enough that you look at this and you start asking questions. I mean, one main question, right? Why? <laughs> like, why is this happening? I started with something random, and yet, like part of mathematics is, there are patterns everywhere, even in places you wouldn't expect them. Now remember, we're also doing this under this heading, so you actually have a leg up on most people who I showed this to, you can prove, you have enough knowledge in your head, I promise, to prove why this happens in at least three different ways. I'm only going to focus on one of them, the one which is the heading, but I just want to give you a few minutes to play for a moment and try and talk this out with the people around you. Why is this happening? I'll give you a few minutes to have a go, make some theories, and then we'll come back together and I'll show you how to do this. Off you go. Let's have a go at this. Now the first uh, prelude I'm going to give to this is, I first discovered this property way before vectors was introduced into the extension 1 and extension 2 courses. And I thought, huh, like it just tickled me that something so random can lead to something so structured and predictable. And that was quite strange to me. It felt magic, actually. And then I thought, well, why is this true? Mathematicians always ask the question, why? Right? Now you can prove this. I mentioned at least three different ways. Right? The first way is, you could put some coordinates on this thing. You could say, oh, let's call this x1, y1, x2, y2, like they're all random, right? x3, y, you just put some names on things and then start to apply coordinate geometry to what you know here. For example, if this was x1, y1 and this was x2, y2, then you know the coordinates of this spot. What would the coordinates be? That'd be x1 plus x2 divided by two. You're finding the midpoint, yeah? 
y1 plus, etc. You get the idea, right? Now you can do this. It is long and arduous, right? You'll get there though. Another way you could do it is you could just use, like, we're drawing parallelograms and other kinds of shapes, right? You can put some fairly simple constructions on here and prove this using similar triangles. It's better than coordinate geometry, but it's still a fairly long and arduous process, okay? We have somewhat more powerful tools at our disposal. Believe it or not, this entire proof that I'm about to show you is two lines, and they're not even long lines. Emmanuel just looked up at me because he's like, I just wrote my 10th line, uh-oh, okay? I'm not saying your method's wrong, but there's a faster way. However, we are gonna need to set up our diagram right so the two lines just work. So, if you've got nothing else on your diagram, sorry, let me start that sentence again. If your diagram is now really busy, because you've put all this stuff on it, what I'd advise you to do is underneath that diagram, just briefly, draw a nice, neat, clean one, because I might put some fairly different labels and things like that on here, and we don't want to confuse it with what you've got, okay? Here's where I'm going to begin. I'm going to use vectors to express or describe each of the sides and lengths that I've got here, okay? Now, you can do it a bunch of different ways. Here's the way I'm going to do it. See this, uh, I'm going to call this point up here in the top left, I'm going to call that like a beginning spot, okay? Um, in fact, I'm even going to write beginning here just so you can see why. If I begin there, right, I'm going to describe this top length here as a vector. A vector has, think back to lesson one, two components. What are they? Magnitude and direction. So I've got a magnitude, which is the length of this side, but then I have to choose direction. And I could describe that side in at least two different ways, going this way or going that way, right? Now, why do you think I called this one beginning? Where do you think I'm going to send my vector? To the right, okay? So let's put an arrow there. Right, now it's a vector, because it's got direction. And uh, let's just call it A, shall we? No big deal. Now, I'm gonna begin up there, and I'm gonna keep going, right? So normally we, we think about in um, geometry, we think about labeling points, but in vector land, I'm thinking about labeling lengths and sides here, right? So I've begun up there, I'm gonna just keep going around the quadrilateral, right? So I've got another vector here, this long one down on this side, and very creatively, I'm gonna call it B, okay? Now, even though a logical thing might be to just keep on going around, if we were labeling this the points, we'd call them like capital A, capital B, we'd just go like clockwise, right? I'm actually going to return back to the beginning. Just come back over here. And I'm going to label this side, I'm going to call it C. Right? I'm going to make this the beginning again, and I've got C here, and that makes my last one D. And uh, it needs direction as well, of course. So far, so good? Okay. He, uh, this is C, this one's C, and then this one is D. So two separate vectors. Following so far? Okay, fantastic. Now, vectors have magnitude, they have direction. When we take midpoints, right, when we take midpoints, this is not a rhetorical question, out of those two things, magnitude and direction, when you take a midpoint, one thing changes, the other does not. Magnitude, direction. Which one stays the same? Direction stays the same. If you have a look at this midpoint here, it's going in the same direction as A, right? But its other thing, its magnitude has changed. What operation do we apply to a vector to keep its direction the same but change its magnitude? Think back. It's not a complicated operation. It's one of the very first ones you learn. You multiply by what? What do you multiply by? A Scalar, right? You multiply by a scalar, okay? Because that doesn't change which direction you're going, just changes the length, right? Makes it longer or shorter. To get to a midpoint, what would be the appropriate scalar to multiply by? Half. It'd be half, right? Because you want to go in the same direction, but only go half as far. So that would make this vector here half A. Do you agree with that? Um, this is also half A over here as well, but I'm actually just going to leave that for now. It's just going to cloud my diagram. What's this one over here? This one over here. Half C, right? Because that's, that's C there. Half C. I should also put on, we should all put on, the vectors have to have direction as well. So really I should have that arrow hanging over there and this arrow going here. If I wanted the arrow going the opposite direction, I'd also have to have a minus sign, wouldn't I? Okay. So far, so good. Now I'm going to come down to here and maybe the cogs are starting to turn. Okay. What's this vector? Here, I know I've left off, you're like, what happened over here? You'll see why in a second. I'm gonna come all the way down to here. What's going on here? It's half B, right? They're both 
half B. But this time I'm going to start from the midpoint and go all the way to the end. So here's another green arrow. In fact, I'll even make this whole thing green over here just so you can see where it starts and ends. That's half B. And then lastly, I'm going to say over here, from this bin point down to the end, let me draw in for you. Sorry, Mrs. Lees, I'm partly ruining your whiteboard markers. What's that kind of called? We've done it four times now, this is half D. Okay, fantastic. All right, now I promised this would be a two line proof. We've done all the setup we need. Are you ready? I said, here's the beginning. I didn't label it, but what would you call this? What would be an appropriate name for it? Okay. It's the end, right? You start up there and you end down here. And one of the things you might recall, um, I think we were talking about associativity actually when we were doing it, is if you have some beginning and some end, right? No matter what kind of vectors you take to get there, right? They're actually going to have in total the same value. If you start at the same point, you end at the same point. Even if this is just called the x vector, if you went A, B, C, D, E, F, right? You add them all up, you end at the same spot, right? So what can you tell me about the relationships between A, B, C, and D, being that they begin here and they end here, what could you write? What equation could come out of that? Any takers? What do you think? Just take a stab in the dark. Here's why, right? Um, I had a math teacher many, many years ago who said to me when I was a student, he said, when you get posed a question, always guess, always guess. I was like, really? Like in the Australian maths competition, if you guess, you get penalized. He said, no, always guess, here's why. If you're right, you will feel amazing. Like, ha, see that, right? And you can go to your friends. If you're wrong, you'll learn something. Could you be like, huh, why was my guess wrong? What's going on in my brain? Someone give me something, anything. The addition of the vectors would be the same, is what Tarun's saying. I like the idea, but I need a bit more specificity here because I have a lot of vectors on here. Which vectors do I add? It gives me the same thing. A and B. What am I doing to them again? I'm adding them. A plus B, where does it send you? From the beginning to the end. I could, in fact, draw like one big diagonal across here that would be equivalent to A plus B. And we're saying that's equal to C plus B. D, because again, same start point, same end point. That was line one. Here comes line two. Uh, this thing here, right, the sum of vectors is itself a vector, right? It's the big long one that I suppose I could just draw all the way through, okay? This is also a vector, right? So I can do this same scalar multiple out the front and it's an equation. The left and the right hand side will stay equal. So I'm gonna multiply by a half. Is that okay? Nothing too dramatic so far? Believe it or not, those are the two lines. That's it. You're still looking at it thinking, I'm not, it's not quite clicking for me. Okay, half of a plus b. That's on the diagram. I just haven't actually put it on yet. Where is half of a plus b? Where is it? Have a think. Hmm. Now it's a bit cruel of me, because remember I, I left off a lot of stuff on the diagram. Where is it? Where would you put it, Maya? It's one of the red lines. It's one of the red lines. Which one? The midpoint of a to B, right? Remember I said this is half A, this is half A as well. This is my somewhat, like I wanted to give you clues but not make it too obvious, okay? If this is half A and this is half B, this, um, this actual parallel sign doesn't help you, it's going the other opposite direction, right? Half A plus half B is this vector right here. Do you agree with that? In fact, let's go ahead and label that as the case. This is half A plus half B. Start here, end there, yep. Where's half C plus half D? It's the opposite side. Half C plus half D. So that makes this half C plus half D. But we just said in our whole two lines of a proof that half A plus half B is equal to half C plus half D. What were the two things that make up a vector again? They are magnitude, which means these two sides are equal in length and direction, which means these two sides are 
parallel. If you have any kind of shape and the opposite sides are equal and parallel, that's a parallelogram. You don't even need to worry about the other two sides. Go ahead and try it if you want. Like draw two sides randomly that are the same length, going the same direction. When you join them, it has to be a parallelogram no matter where you are. Now, uh, later on as you're going, I will show you what the proofs by corner geometry and the proofs by similar triangles look like. I'll put them up on the screen. They're somewhat nightmarish, right? They're the things you want to do if you're like, I'm trying to fall asleep at night. I will write this stupid long proof. This is a perfect example of the elegance and power that vectors give you to prove sometimes things you already knew and sometimes things you didn't.